Let's all stand and turn to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk fast tonight, and um, I want to get out of here at a, at a quick hour so that you can go to the parents' orientation downstairs and not have to make it too long of a night. So if you listen fast, I'll talk fast, okay? Genesis chapter 3. We'll read the first six verses tonight. Genesis chapter number 3. If you open your Bibles, it's Genesis, and then just stop there, okay? Uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. The serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her. And he did eat. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the few minutes we have tonight. I pray that you'd help us to see this truth. Lord, this, uh, we can cu- catch up in our lives and, and cause us to do things and, and make decisions, Lord, that would be unwise and not right. So I pray you'd help us to get the truths you have for us this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Of course, we understand that life is a matter of choices. Where we are, where we're going, where we end up will all be determined by these choices that we make in our life. So our choices are important. They have potential. They have consequences. Yet in spite of that, many people make choices flippantly or make choices uh, 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 based on influence or pressure, not realizing that they are the ones who will live with the consequences. We don't think it through. We're easily influenced. Um, in the Bible, we won't go into it, but in Hebrews chapter 11, it talks about Moses who, who made a choice. He chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to, than to really become, to, to stay where he was, living with Pharaoh and the, the palace and, and being taken care of. He made a right decision. Most of our bad decisions that we make are, are kind of like, to be honest with you, they're almost like bad financial decisions that we make. We're pressured and we do things. and That's why we try to have, you know, you tell someone, hey, have sales resistance. There's a reason they use salesmen to sell things. Because they're trying to get you to buy something you wouldn't normally buy. Okay? That's a salesman's job. And so, uh, you know, when we go shopping, you have, to have, you have to have sales resistance. Well, really, we need to have spiritual sales resistance. Because, to be honest with you, the greatest salesman that ever lived was Satan. He sold Adam and Eve a bill of goods, and he's been selling it to us all along. We need resistance. What is resistance? Being content with what we have, using and caring for what we have, and keeping our focus on the purpose for which God made us. If we can do that, we'll resist the things that we're going to look at in a minute that Satan will throw our way. His goal is to, to knock us off from doing the things we're supposed to do in our life and get us to do things that would cause us to go away from God's will and God per, God's purpose for our life. And he uses his salesmanship to do it. How does he do that? How do companies sell things to you? They use alluring advertising. It's all about the advertisement. How they advertise, their advertisement is almost like a bait to a trap to get you to buy what they want you to buy. And they're going to give you every angle, and we'll look at some of the angles tonight that Satan used to get us to get something that maybe, sometimes it's something we do need. But Satan's goal is to use his advertising to get us to take things we don't need and move us off the path that God has for us to move upon a path of our own choosing. What is advertising? It's carefully planned appeals to our human weakness designed to make us discontent what we have so that we can rationalize bad decisions 
and get things we know we do not need and should not have. By the way, that's why you go shopping, you buy stuff you don't need, right? Uh, when it was our anniversary a couple months ago, my wife and I spent the day together. We were, I took her to Seal Beach. We went a bunch of places, but we stopped at Seal Beach. And we're walking down Main Street, looking at all the girly stores and all that nonsense, you know, being a good husband. And uh, there was a guy's store there. I'm like, I'm in. And I went in. I said, now, I've been looking at all your girly stores and all. We're going in the men's store. And it had men's stuff. And to be honest with you, it was stuff I didn't need. But as soon as I walked in, it's like, I'm buying something. It had man's packaging. I mean, you know, the, the neat little boxes and all the man. It was like, man, I don't even want, I don't even need that, but I'm going to buy it because it's a man thing. Now, fortunately, my wife got to me and said, you know, you probably don't need to do that. I'm like, well, where were you when you're shopping? But it's advertising. You go in there and you didn't plan on anything. It's like, wait a minute, I can't live without that. I need that right now. That's what advertising is supposed to do. That's what Satan does. Satan, in here, took Adam and Eve, two people, only two people, they had no sin at that time, they lived in a perfect environment, and they had a personal relationship with God, and they had everything they needed. By the way, when someone says, you know, people are a product of their environment, that may influence them, but we don't have to choose to continue down that path. It's not our environment that makes us bad. It's giving in to our sinful desires. Because Adam and Eve had a perfect environment, and yet they still went wrong. That's the story tonight. So we see in Satan how he gets us and packages things to get us to take those things and do those things we know are not right or that which God would not want us to do. I have many points today, so I want you, I, well, let's get right into it. How is Satan the greatest salesman? Well, first of all, he uses beautiful and successful appearing models. Now, when Satan came to them, in verse number one, he was not the, 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 the picture that we see in him. By the way, the Bible tells us Satan is not ugly. He's beautiful. Probably a lot like me. Um, don't laugh, please. Did you just call me Satan? You did. Okay, look at this guy. All right. Staff orientation. No raise for Brother Ross. Okay. Look, how do they appeal to us? They always use the best. Okay. Uh, now, you, you shouldn't watch alcohol uh, uh, advertisements, but I know how they are at work. They, they don't use, look, they don't show you the wino in the gutter. They show you a bunch of beautiful people in their prime, and they're all, do listen, that's not what they look like. You start drinking a little bit, that's not how you act. That's not what you're going to end up like. He lies. He always shows us what seems to be the best because he's trying to put a good spin on what he's trying to get us to do. You see these restaurant menus sometimes, and, and you know what they do? They, have, they actually have a, they'll, they'll have someone put together a plate, and they'll take a picture of it. That's on the menu. Can I just tell you something? Usually the food that you get on your plate at the restaurant doesn't look anything like that. Okay, that was, that was a food model. And uh, you know what you get? By the way, I don't really care what it looks like. Okay, you can make it look good and plate it and have the parsley. Look, at the parsley you don't eat anyhow. Chuck that. Throw it. Okay, get rid of that stuff, get rid of the garnish, take the food, grab a fork, dive in, and come out happy. That's how it works. But they, it, it, it doesn't look like that. They always try to make the model look good. Bars are, few, are filled with beautiful people if you look at advertisement. They make sin look good, you know. You get to do your own thing. I used to get these emails, and, and I don't know how I got them. They got the church email address, and they quit sending them for that website, uh, Ashley Madison. It was a website that was promoting uh, uh, affairs. And I, I, I got the first one. I just see the headline because I get those, and I just hit the delete button because you get a lot of them. But it said, you know, life is short, have an affair. And their whole promotion is have an affair with someone who's married because if you're married, because then you won't want anybody else to know. Can I just tell you something? They make it look appealing, but it's garbage. By the way, ask the Duggar kid. He just got busted. Okay? Listen, that sin always looks good, but it doesn't turn out well. You go in thinking, wow, this is the best thing in the world, and then you get caught up in it, and you don't see the end. 
They don't show you the broken families. They don't show you the kids that are being raised in single, uh, single parent families and they're going back and forth from this mom to that dad and this step parent to that step parent and, and, and there's no security in their family. They don't show you that. They always make it look good. And that's what Satan did. Next, he appealed directly to one in the family in order to put pressure on the rest of the family. Now, for some reason, he didn't go to Adam. He caught Eve alone. I guess he figured he could get her. Because he knew if he got her, that she would get him. By the way, the Bible tells us that. Now, before we get too hard on the lady saying, aha, it's Eve's fault. It actually is Eve's fault. We'll just throw her under the bus. Uh, and it's been the lady's fault every single since, Brother Ross. But you know what? She was deceived. Adam went into it with his eyes open because he saw that his wife did it, and he was pressured, and he went along with it. Isn't that what Satan does? He tries. Look, he knows if he can get one of the parents in the family, it's going to affect every single person in that family family. Now, uh, I have to be careful if I go shopping with my wife, because I see something I do want. She's the type like, yeah, you should get it. It's like, sister, I do the finances. We shouldn't get it. <laughs> Remember years ago, uh, we were, we were, our finances were a lot more tighter in those days, and we got a, um, it, we got a, a, a tax return. It was, it was a decent amount. We could really use it. But I decided, and I asked her, because I'm a good husband, even though I was going to do it anyhow, but I asked her, said, you know, I want to get a Palm Pilot or a digital camera. Because uh, uh, I need a digital camera because I did the tracks and I wanted to take pictures. This was back in the early days. But I really wanted a Palm Pilot because organizational thing. And I really love that thing. I don't know why I had a love affair with that thing. I love that thing. But anyhow, I, I told my wife, I said, I'm going to get one of the two. And she goes, that's great. You should do it. Now, I set her up. I said, honey, I want you to come with me to help me make the decision. Because <laughs> I know how she is when we go shopping. So I, she could care less. She barely knows how to use her phone, Okay. Uh, and, and I'm like, just come. And I, I showed her the Palm Pilot. I said, this is beautiful. Let me show you the digital camera. And I'm like, yeah. and, you know, I showed her all the features. She could care less about the features. I was going somewhere with this. I'm like, now, honey, which one should I get? She said, you know, Steve, you deserve both of them. I was like, no, no, honey, that's, that's not what, are you sure? <laughs> and I came home with both of them, Okay. What would you do? I set her up. Now, usually she sets me up. But that's what Satan does. He doesn't try to get you to spend. But Satan, if he can get one in the family, he's got his foot in the door. By the way, you, chill, you kids, you have a, a siblings, especially the older ones, if he gets you, you can set a bad precedent for the ones underneath you. He's trying to worm his way in the door. That's what he always does. Number three, we've really got to hurry. He seeks to create doubt about established standards and commandments. Verse 1, And hath God said, ye shall, eat, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? See, he was always, he just tries to create a little doubt in our mind. Usually before you go into a store, you know where your finances are. But once you start kind of get in there and you see something you want, you, things get a little fuzzy. And then if you go, by the way, that's why I don't want to deal with salesmen. Whenever we buy a car, I, I talk to salesmen and I leave. I, don't, I never deal with them. I just, give me your best price. I'm talking to 20 people and, and I ain't talking to you. And I'm not going, to, oh, here, let me go get you a card. No, no, don't go get the sales manager. I'm not talking to him either. I know all their tricks. I'm not going to let them pressure me. I'm making my own decision. Give me it at the price I want. Don't, don't push me. Um, but but that, that's what happens to us. We, we, we get in there, we start getting a little fuzzy about things. And that's what he did to her. Did, did God really, are you sure? Are you absolutely, positively sure this is what God said? She's like, huh. By the way, we see later she gets confused. She starts adding stuff. Stuff's getting taken away. It's confusing. He tries to cause doubt. We always, look, God wants us to create doubt about, well, you know, is the Bible really the best way to go? I mean, is that exactly really what God meant? And we listen to what society says, and we don't want to hear them chirp at us because we're Christians. And so we start to kind of change what we believe. Does God really mean it to that extent? I hear the hiss of Satan when I hear that. Okay, doubt is never of God. 
When we're doubting what's right, it's always of Satan. He tries to equate God's commands with restrictions. Isn't that what he's saying? Is, in essence, God, did God really say that? Is he really keeping you from something? That's how we look at it. We look at, there are, by the way, there are commandments and restrictions in the Bible. Oh, that's just a bunch of do's or don'ts. No, the Bible's not a bunch of do's or don'ts. But let me say this, there are do's and don'ts in there. And those do's and don'ts aren't in there to hurt us. They're in there to help us. They're to keep us from those things which would hurt us. Satan casts the doubt. He wants us to be a rebel. Rebels don't, you know, rebels don't, don't, don't follow the laws. They do their own thing. No one's telling me what to do. Rebellion sells. Uh, many years ago, there was someone that came to the church for a little bit, and they asked, uh, they asked me to go do a funeral for uh, the sister who died. I didn't know the sister, and I talked to the family. And, they, yeah, you know, they're a Christian and everything. I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll talk to Pal. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I don't, we don't do that anymore, but we, we helped him out. I went and did the funeral after I got up and, you know, said the nice things, and, and, and we had a funeral. At the end, they said, we want to play this person's favorite song. And the song was, I did it my way. Now, that's not really something I'd want to play. And I, I don't know if they just liked, I, I don't know if they really understood what it was. But I don't want to, but most of us, that's how we live our lives. I did it my way. Why do we do that? Because Satan causes doubt that God's way is not the best way. Next, this goes with it. He pressures you to reject God's warnings. Verse 4, he, he, after all the confusion, he goes back and forth with her. He finally says, you will not surely die. He's like, you know what? It isn't true. Just, just bypass it. Don't listen to what God says. Most of the time, the reason we sin or do something wrong is we put ourselves into situations where, where we, we put ourselves in the wrong situations, and then the pressure starts to mount. By the way, the second you start feeling pressure to do anything, you ought to just back away. Say, I'm going to give it time. You know, the second you are texting maybe a, a somebody at work or you have to have comment and they say something inappropriate, you get that little feeling. Like, was that inappropriate? If you're thinking it, it was. That's the time to back away immediately. Don't feel, pre don't feel pressure to do anything. That's say, so many of it. Look, that's, that's a whole salesman job. His whole job is to, to get, pressure you to make that decision because that's how he gets paid. And Satan's putting pressure on, look, you're not going to die. Let's do it. Come on. Never follow the pressure. We think that consequences, bad consequences, are things that only happen to other people. I'll smoke my whole life, but I won't get cancer. Ca cancer. I can drink, but I can handle it. I can do, you know, think of it from a financial. I can, I can continue to use my credit card, and I won't get into financial pressure. We always think consequences are for the other person. We always get away with it. It's not going to affect us. It's not going to happen to me. And then we bow to the pressure. Think of Lot's wife. As they fleed the city, they believed God enough to leave the city because they believed that if they stayed in the city, God was going to blow the city up. But yet when he gave them one command, don't look back, I'll turn you into a pillar of salt, she disobeyed that command and she looked back. She must have thought she was an exception. I know she didn't have a death wish because if she had a death wish, she would have stayed in the city. Next, Satan, he wants to create discontentment in your spirit. Verse number five, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened. So by comparison, what's he saying? If you don't eat the fruit, then your eyes are closed. You have, you're, you're, you're missing out. You're not seeing everything. You're not getting everything you should have. Your eyes are closed right now. And God knows that. And after all, he's holding out on you because he knows that if you eat, your eyes are going to be open. You'll be able to see things correctly. You'll be able to, to do what you want to do. Isn't that what sales pressure is all about? Creating discontentment? Satan tries to create discontentment in our lives. You know, I'm missing out. Look, you teenagers, you know, you go to our school and, and you know, boy, I, I wish at, the, at, the, at these other schools, they get to do this, this, and this. Well, first of all, we aren't the other schools, okay? 
this isn't pairing orientation, but let me just throw that at you right now. This isn't those other schools. Okay, we're going to follow, we're trying to follow, we're trying to keep things clean to the best of our ability here. But you look and say, I'm missing out on something. That's discontentment. Whenever you feel like you're missing out on something, you're going to go try to find it. It bothered me as a 17-year-old or 18, early 18-year-old when I went into church. I came out of the world. I came out of the nonsense of that life I was living. And here I am coming into church, and I was meeting uh, uh, peers my own age who had been raised in the church, and they were wanting to go out to where I just came from. I'm thinking, you don't want that. But they were somehow Satan had got them discontent about their life thinking it's better if I go out and I have the freedom to do all those things over there. Everything will be better. I'm missing out. You're missing out. The consequences of sin. The pain of sin. Look at God is not holding out on us. God wants what is best for us. And so we must trust him. Next. He entices us by pushing an independent spirit. And we made reference to that. He said, ye shall be as gods. Now, uh, he, he wasn't a Mormon thinking you're going to be a god. His whole point was there is, you will be the decision maker in your life. You'll be, you'll be the top dog. You'll be the boss. No one else will tell you what to do. You can make your own decisions. You can be in charge of your life. No rules. No authorities. He strokes that independent spirit. And by the way, it's kind of built into us because we're, we're, we're sinful flesh. And we always want to kind of, you know, all we like sheep have, we've turned away, we've gone our own way. And we're still like that to this day. And Satan kind of pushes that. Don't let anybody tell you what to do. Don't, don't listen to the, Look, you make your own decisions. Whenever we make our own decisions, we're going to make bad decisions. There's too many important things in life for us to miss out on it. One bad decision could have consequences that can last through the years. One bad... And how would you, you don't want to, you young people, you don't want to be an adult. 15, 20 years from now, your life's fine, you're serving the Lord, but you look back and say, I regret that one decision. I wish I would have listened. I wish I would have paid attention. You don't want to do that. Say, Bob, but I know better, and I know, you know, children, they know better than their parents, I know. Ryan sent me that, that thing, I forgot what it said, but it's like, it's telling the kids, listen, don't listen to your parents. Don't do anything. Move out. Get a job. Move out. Get your own place right now while you still know everything. Seems like the younger we are, the more we think we know, right? The older we get, the more we realize we didn't know as much as we thought we knew. Next, he pushes us to depend solely on human reasoning. Now, we looked at what he said. He goes, you shall be as gods. He explains it as you read further. Knowing good or evil. In other words, deciding. You decide what's right. You decide what's good. You decide what's wrong. You decide what's evil. We make those decisions. That means we make those decisions based solely on what we know and what we think. Do you understand that God knows a lot more than we know? God understands everything from where we are to what's going to happen in the future. And whenever we think that we can make those decisions, we don't need God. We'll decide what's best for our life. We are setting ourselves up for pain. For pain. I don't want to live my life having to base all my decisions on what I think. That's why God gave us his word. That's why we can go to God's word when we have decisions say, what would God want me to do? It's right there in the book. But our independent spirit says, no, I think I know what's best. I think I'll make that decision. I think I'll go my own path. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Don't trust your reasoning. I don't know how many people I've talked to in the years, and they, well, they'll make some horrendous decision, or they're dealing with some consequence, and I'll say, what happened? Say, well, I just thought, well, it seemed to me, 
Well, I had to make some decision. Next. He gets you to override spiritual caution by the luring promise of meeting a true need. Now, now he gets her all confused. He's done the salesman pitch. He's ready to, he's ready to come in. Now, how does Eve react? Verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food. God said don't eat it. But, but after a while, she's all confused. She starts looking at it. She goes, it's just food. I mean, how unhealthy can flaming hot Cheetos really be? You know, it, it's good. It's food. I need food after all. And that's food. See how she starts to, to, to um, yeah, she just, in her mind, she's making it seem okay. After all, it's a need I have. How many people have had affairs and they'll say, you know, I just wasn't, I just wasn't getting my needs met. Or after all, this is a horrendous decision, but I thought I really needed that. We get ourselves into trouble. By the way, let me just make it real easy for us. If God says we don't need it, we don't need it. Oh, but, you know, I know so-and-so. Hey, listen, you don't know the whole story of so-and-so. I always just follow God. Next, he makes it appealing to the lust of the eye, and we won't spend a lot of time with this. So she looked at the food. She goes, that's good for food. And then she goes, and it was pleasant to the eyes. Isn't it always? Isn't it always? Doesn't it always look nice? It always looks like something we need to have that we want to have. You know, look, we don't see everything, though. You only see the outside. You don't see the underworkings. It's like a bad illustration, but the Wizard of Oz. He looked good when the smoke and the lights and the eyeballs were glowing, but when you pulled the, the curtain back, he was just a little guy and a microphone and a fog machine. We don't see everything. I know one person that does, though. God sees everything. He knows the underpinnings. He knows the roots. He knows where it's going to lead to. He knows where it's going to go to. And then the last thing is this. He offered fulfillment apart from God. It's a tree to be desired to make one wise. Now, before the summer started, we were teaching through Proverbs on Thursday. We'll eventually get back to it in a couple weeks. But God in Proverbs wants us to have wisdom. And wisdom, as we saw, comes from God. But you know what Satan says? is like, let's cut out the middleman. You don't need God. Eat the tree. It'll make you wise. You'll be, able to, you'll, you'll be fine. You don't need God to have fulfillment in life. Can I just tell you something? Yes, you do. You can search in everything. If I had the right job, I'd be happy. I know many people that have had their dream jobs and they're not happy. If I just had the right amount of money in my bank account, I'd be happy. Some of the most miserable people I've ever met had money. If I just need security and fulfillment, that would make me happy. And they're not. True, complete fulfillment comes from God and nowhere else. And whenever you're trying to put something else in there, you're falling for something that's false. It's not true. It's not real. It's not genuine. It's not going to help you. They didn't listen. They listened to the world's greatest salesman, and they, they paid the price. Their lives were damaged. She took of the fruit and she gave unto her husband with her. Now she took him down. They lost. They were out of the Garden of Eden. By the way, that sin passed down from generation to generation to generation based on one decision made because they followed the pressure of Satan. Now, how are you doing today? It's easy when you're in church to be motivated. It's easy, yeah, you know, I want to follow God. I want to do the right thing, and I'll come to the altar. That's great. But when you get up from the altar, you are going to walk outside. Many of you adults, you're going to go to work. And I just tell you something, the people at work are going to say, hey, um, so what did you learn in church yesterday? Hey, what did you get out of your Bible this morning? They're not talking about that. The flesh starts to kick in. 
we see something we're supposed to maybe shy away from, and that pressure starts to build. What are you going to do? Don't buy into the lie. You can boil Satan's lie down to one thing, and we're done. He just wants you to do whatever you want to do. And he'll use any angle he can to get you to do it. That's his doctrine. If you were to find a person that says they're a Satanist, they worship Satan, if you talk to them long enough, and I've talked to, I've met a couple out soul winning, you talk to them, their doctrine is, isn't, you know, I worship a guy with horns. You ask them, say, well, what do you think? I think that you need to follow your own path. You need to decide what works for you, and I decide what works for me, and we'll all be happy together. That's Satan. And he packages it nicely. He makes it look good. He pushes us on us, and he puts pressure on us. But let's not buy it. Because the packaging may look nice, but if you open it up and there's nothing good inside, I shouldn't say this, one of our staff guys <laughs> one time bought a computer from somebody. I'm not going to say who it is. It's a nice Apple computer at a good price. It was packaged in a box, but when they opened it up, it was an old broken Windows computer. Okay, don't buy the advertisement. Oh, look at the package. It's very nice. This looks great. You like potato chips. Oh, look at this. I'm going to eat all these potato chips. You open it up, and 75% of the bag is air. It's like there's four chips in there, and they're all broke. Don't buy it. It doesn't pay off. Let's all stand together this evening.